Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Welcome everyone. This is Brie Noble and I am excited to be here today with Megan Kuhar. We are going to talk about branding and social media and content and all that stuff that needs to be working for you in your marketing to actually help you make a profit from music. But before we get to that, I'd love to have Megan just let you know a little bit about her background, her musical background, how she got into working in these areas of music marketing and what she she does uh, on a daily basis in the different parts of her, her business and her work. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I am a professor of music technology. I'm a creative brand and tech coach. Um, I'm an audio engineer, videographer, social media manager. Um, as a musician, I play percussion and a little bit of keyboards uh, for fun, but um, I really have been a musician all of my life and I love singing and harmonies and all sorts of things. So, um, I went to music school, I studied percussion and when I graduated, it was when the great recession really started hitting. And so it was really hard to, I was, I was working in arts management. I was majoring in arts management at the time. And, um, you know, I couldn't find a nonprofit arts job. It was very hard, <laughs> um, Plus I also didn't really want one. I think it was kind of a little bit of like a blessing in disguise. Um, so I ended up going back to school for audio engineering and then I went to teaching and I started really working with, um, with individuals that were musicians or artists that really wanted to kind of get more into technology. As I continued to do that, I had my own business on the side um, where I was recording on location and, um, you know, really enjoyed being an entrepreneur and working on my own thing. I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. So it just sort of, it was natural to me to, to want to start projects uh, all the time. Um, but really as I kind of grew this business, I, really didn't know what I was doing about marketing myself. I mean, everything, every gig I got was word of mouth. It was just friends of friends or people that knew people that knew me. And, um, you know, I kind of just grew my business that way, but it never got, it was always a side hustle. And I mean like tiny side hustle. So, um, what I ended up doing was really diving into learning about branding and marketing and social media. Um, I ended up getting my master's in music technology, but when I was doing that, I inquired with the communications department and asked them if I could take courses in communications as well, which I did. And I loved and, um, had a particular professor that was a great influence for me. And, um, I learned a lot about marketing because I always wanted to sort of merge the two fields. I felt like musicians didn't know what they were doing when it came to promoting themselves. And sometimes they didn't even want to promote themselves. The biggest thing that I want, the biggest like misconception that I want to, uh, squash is that promoting yourself is narcissistic or, um, that it has to be phony or it has to be inauthentic for it to work. Um, I just think that's so common. I see it all the time in my, in my college students and in my clients, and, um, you know, I really just try to work on kind of instilling more hope that like you can promote yourself and feel good about it. And you can, you know, grow a business, um, as an artist, as a creative and feel good about it. So, um, as soon as I really kind of merged all of my interests and expertise into like one blended person was when I really started growing this business of mine that I'm uh, in right now. So, um, so I love it. I love, uh, you know, coaching and I love working with clients and I do the same thing in my professor job as well. It's kind of like my whole life is like 
the same every day. Like I talk about the same stuff all the time. So it's just a lot of fun to really, um, to really help creatives rethink branding and marketing. This is really cool. Cause we have a lot more in common than I realized. So first of all, I have to circle back to the whole like arts management and nonprofits. Yeah. I did the same thing. So I wanted to, I wanted to get, um, a master's degree in arts management and I had applied to UCLA, which was like, they only accept 10 people a year into their arts management program. So I didn't get in, but, um, you know, I had thought, well, I'm going to go get a degree in, um, you know, an MBA or something. Maybe I'm going to use that in, in the arts in some way. Um, but I ended up not getting that, which was actually a super huge blessing because I ended up getting a job in a nonprofit in arts management anyway, uh, (laughs) after a few years and, you know, you're probably glad that you didn't like, there's some great things about working in a nonprofit. And I I worked in at an opera company. So it was amazing to like see these awesome productions put on the stage and be able to get sit in the front row and go to all these fancy parties and things like that. But nonprofit world is hard. And I actually ended up leaving because of the stress that it's such a feast or famine situation where we'd be like, you know, doing our subscription, run and getting millions of dollars in the door and, and we're flush and everything seems good. And then the summer you're like, am I going to be able to make payroll? So, you know, I, I think that ugh, I'm glad that I did it, but and like, I learned a ton, but it is very stressful. And it also, you know, helped me see like, how can we as artists not have that feast or famine kind of thing, because that is just not fun when you're in it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't inspire you to be creative because you're always thinking about, you know, when am I not going to be able to afford to do this anymore? So I just wanted to mention that because we had that in common. And then also like what you were saying about bringing all these things together into one cohesive person of like the marketing and the music and all that stuff. I had the same situation when I first started trying to be an artist out there and not, not knowing how to merge those things, not realizing that I could yeah. put the marketing together with the music. And I think that I had just always seen that, you know, when you're doing music, you're not promoting, you're just doing the music. And, you know, maybe you'd bring someone else on later on when you got big enough that would do that quote promotional stuff for you. But that's kind of the way I thought in the beginning. And then when I realized, Hey, you know, like the chances of me getting big enough where I would have a lay be on a label or have a manager or whatever, were pretty small. And I needed to figure that stuff out for myself. I went through the the same thing you did. And I finally was able to kind of merge that entrepreneurship and, and music into something that worked. Um, but I got to ask about, about branding, because for me as a musician, branding was really hard. I'm not a visual person. I'm not a designer. I, I second guess every single design choice that I would ever make. Um, and, you know, for my brand and all that stuff. And so Let's start out by talking about, let's talk about the mistakes, first of all, that artists make, because let me tell you, I probably made all of them in relation to branding and content and marketing. Um, And then we'll get into like how to fix these and how to do it correctly. So why don't you outline the kind of the the mistakes that you see that people are, are making? Sure. So first of all, branding isn't just about design and like it it really actually is primarily about message, right? So, um, when you're thinking about building your brand, um, actually, you know, I just said that out loud and I thought to myself, building is not quite the right verb for that because it's really more about uncovering your brand Mm. because your brand is really, um, it's really your identity for, for people that are working in personal branding. Right. So that's mostly what I work in. I don't work with companies to help them brand, but even if I did, I would probably give them similar prompts and think, and you know, they would be thinking more about like the personality of their company, but, um, but those who are working with them, like for themselves as a personal brand, really what you're doing is you're learning how to be yourself clearly and consistently. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. (laughs) So when, and they don't, because they, they look at social media and they think they have to be that way or this way, or that person's way or the other way. 
And, you know, how am I ever going to get 20,000 followers unless I follow these, you know, whatever Instagram is telling me to do all the time. And, um, it's just not about that. It's about learning how to uncover your identity and be able to communicate it clearly. Um, I think because, that's really good yeah. because uh, like what I know I did is that I, I was trying to like project this other thing over me as a brand. Like I thought I had to be like a corporate brand. I mean, way back when I was starting to try to brand myself as a musician. And so I was trying to create this logo that was like corporate. -y. I wanted people to think that like I was professional and all that stuff. And so do you see artists trying to do that? Um, yeah, I, well, I see a lot of artists trying to fit a mold for sure. Um, and especially I work, so I work in a conservatory, so I work with mainly classical musicians and, um, you know, in that part of my job, in my, in my business, I work with all sorts of creatives, but, um, but the classical musicians in particular, um, and I was, you know, I was one, um, you know, they really are sort of set on a specific mold that they're supposed to follow. Um, there is a formula that they think they need to follow in order to be successful. So it's hard to break them out of that mindset of, Hey, yeah, you don't have to like be buttoned up all the time. You know, like you can definitely be yourself and have personality and people want that, you know, even the opera companies want that now, like they're not looking for, um, perfection person. They're looking for a beautiful voice, obviously. And, and like the music itself has to be really, really stellar and amazing, but they want that person to represent the new face of opera. I mean, we have, um, you know, a singer from the metropolitan opera. That's an alumni of my university who talks about this all the time. She's like, you know, can you sell tickets? <laughs> you know, and people who sell tickets are people that have personality. So, um, so it's really important to break out of that mindset of, I need to fit this mold in order to be successful. So, yeah, I mean, that happens all the time. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I know that I was just like, I think it was because partly I was coming out of a corporate career, you know? So when I thought, yeah, brand, that's what I thought. I thought logo is one major thing I thought when I thought brand as a musician, and when you teach branding, do you, do you think musicians should have a logo and, you know, colors and, and yeah. certain fonts and all that stuff? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I talk about that a lot, um, but it's not the first thing. The first thing we talk about is really about what's your message. What's the, what's the bigger picture here? Um, you know, uh, I just got, before we started this interview, I just got out of a class where we were talking about, um, you know, connecting with your audience and, you know, trying to get them to think about like, I'm not just like an actor. I am like, what's the next level up from what I am. Right. So, um, you know, we used like dove soap as an example. It's like, they don't always talk about soap, you know, they talk about like self-esteem and things like that. So what are the bigger things that you're talking about that people can connect with? That's super important to know. Um, so we start with that as far as logos and colors and fonts. Yeah. I think it's super important to have a consistent visual presence. Um, especially on social media, because the truth is it's a visual platform, right? So people are, um, not only looking for, uh, clarity in the message, but they're also looking for clarity in what they see, which means, um, if you, if you're using like 10 fonts on one picture, it's hard to read. Like, it's just, it's hard to, uh, not, look away from that. Right. So really thinking about like, how do I make this clear literally for, per, for people to read? Um, it, it's important. And also the consistency is important. So like I use a lot of pink in my, in my branding and people just know that that's me when it comes up on their feed, because I use the same colors, the same fonts, the same like vibe with everything I do. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I've evolved it over the years. Um, and you know, I, I really think it's kind of a representation of my own personal style. Anyway, if you're looking at this video, you can see behind me that like, I mean, I pretty much already live in my brand. <laughs> so like, it's the same everywhere. Um, so it's really about kind of uncovering your personal style and, um, and being able to kind of be consistent with that. And as people, we don't ping pong back and forth between like polar opposites. We, we pretty much stay in the same zone and then slowly change over time. So that's kind of what your brand should do too. It shouldn't ping pong all over the place. It should really just maintain some, uh, you know, 
consistency. And then of course, as you evolve, as you, as your taste change, your brand can kind of evolve too, but it's not like a, you know, back and forth polar change all the time. Totally. And I'm glad you said that because I think some people are afraid to brand because they're afraid they're going to just pigeonhole themselves into this space where they then can change. And so they're afraid they're going to make the wrong decision and they're going to be stuck with this brand forever. So yeah, we can, we can evolve our brand for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you don't, you know, people often worry about pigeonholing too, because they're worried about maybe isolating certain people away from like, if I have pink, does that mean guys aren't going to follow me? Right. But it's not true. Like I I'm what I really like to make sure people realize is that your goal is to like ring a bell for a certain ideal follower or audience member. And you want to reach that person. Like you are on my frequency, you're on my vibe. But if you happen to catch the frequency of somebody else while you're doing that, that's okay. I have male clients. I have Uh, I have male followers that really engage with what I do and they appreciate the content. They're not turned off by pink. (laughs) I have the same thing, right? I've spoken to women for years. Um, and I still, I've discovered I had like 20% males on my list. And sometimes they would be like, is it okay that I'm following you? I'm like, (laughs) of course, you know, and now that we're moving more into, to really helping all musicians, but of course, trying to like have a platform to raise up women you know, I do want everyone to be involved. And so, yeah, you're not going to like absolutely turn people off. And, you know, if you do, they're probably not your, they're not right or anyway, totally. You should be turning some people off. Yeah. You should be. And that's, I think like musicians have this mindset of like the scarce scarcity thing, right? Like you said, feast or famine. So they'll take anything. They'll take anything they can get. And it's like, you know, uh, it's like, um, I don't know when I'm going to get another gig. So I'm just going to say yes to this one. That's not a great way to grow an established career. It's a great way to like, maybe, you know, get a lot of random people following you that don't have any connection to you. But like, you really want to start thinking of things differently because the more strategic you can get, the more, you know, yourself and what you want, the more you're going to be able to say no to stuff that comes up. And it's important to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So are there any other major mistakes that musicians make with their branding and marketing that we haven't covered yet? Yeah. I I think one of the biggest things regards content. So, um, so a lot of musicians think of Instagram or social media, like a bulletin board, they use it to post information. Like I have a show coming. I mean, COVID obviously not during this time, but I have a thing coming up. It's Friday at five or at Friday, at you know, whatever time, like $5, make sure you come. And that's like the only time they really show up on social media. Not a great way to uh, grow a following because it's, I mean, think about it. You're using your audience to get them to do something that you want, right? Which is show up to your event. So really rethinking social media to be less like a bulletin board and more like a social, a play, like literally a room, consider it a room that you're walking into. And when you walk into that room, you have to offer them something so that they feel comfortable coming back. Right. So it's a conversation. And if you're just continually asking them for support without offering anything in return, they're not going to stick around, you know, So I think that's such a big thing to remember is that social media should be social. It should be, it should be connection based. It should be, um, you know, based in conversation and in, um, in sharing value and not just posting information. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And, you know, I always encourage my artists to like, I realize it's really hard to be everywhere. We can't focus on all the different social media platforms. So choose one you're going to go all in on and really, really focus there. But let me ask you this, because we have kind of made this mistake in our business a little bit um, in that, you know, we were really all in on Facebook and we were doing Instagram, but we were almost doing it like you just said, right? Because we didn't have time to focus on it but we had quite a lot of followers on Instagram. So we were kind of using it like a billboard and I didn't like it, but I knew I just didn't have the time to invest. And now we're at the point where we, we have totally switched our strategy. We are investing there and we're doing content specifically for that. And what is, 
you know, really going to resonate on that particular platform. So yeah. if you're at that point where you're like, I know I can't invest in this other platform. Um, do you think it's better just to stay off of that platform until you really can focus on doing stuff specifically for that one? Like doing that whole billboard thing, does it hurt you for your future of that platform? Um, that's a great question. I think I would sort of, I would say yes, but it's easier than you think to be involved in, in more than one place. Um, the reason why is because when, when you create content that is, um, value centered, you can share it more than one place without like, you know, losing, like without diluting the content. Right. right. Um, so for instance, like if I were to, um, record a podcast episode and like mine are solo. So I, I, they're all kind of like verbal blog posts in a way. So, um, so, but then they become literal blog posts, blog posts, because I will take the transcription and post it on my blog. And then I'll take pieces of that and create social media out posts out of that. And then like, so it's reused over and over again, um, just so that it's showing up in different places. And I think it's good to do that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you're, what kind of content were you creating on Facebook that you were very engaged with? Was it a group or like just a page? So uh, probably all, I mean, we do have a group. Absolutely. We're very engaged in the group. Um, and we were also, you know, I would do lives and stuff on Facebook for sure. Right. And we were doing, we were obviously putting our podcast on Instagram. It's not like we weren't providing value, but we weren't doing anything specifically for that platform, you know, now we're doing stories that are specifically for that. And we're doing, um, you know, videos specifically for IGTV and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. I don't think it, um, it necessarily hurts your presence to like, just be reposting stuff on a platform without really engaging, but I would consider, um, that you should be engaging at least in one place, like you said. Mm -hmm. So you were really focusing on Facebook and, um, you know, you had a great presence there and you had an audience there and you were growing your audience there. That's the audience that really wants to follow you. And that's good. Um, you know, having that presence on Instagram, be a little bit less, uh, personal. Um, I don't think it would, you know, you would kind of just have to start over if you wanted to start growing that account. Right. So yeah. you would sort of have to pick up where you left off and start growing the account. You wouldn't ha you wouldn't be able to expect that those people are immediately going to start engaging with you. If you suddenly come back. That That's sense. right. And, you know, yeah. when we first started then doing, I wasn't doing a lot of stories when we first started having this, you know, engagement strategy and starting to do stories. Yeah. We weren't getting a ton of engagement at first because they weren't used to seeing stories from us, you know, but now we're getting more. So it does take a little bit of a ramping up period. Yeah. It's sure. probably two different audiences. Really. You probably yes. have, you know, new followers on Instagram that didn't participate on Facebook. So it's a new phase for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, cause I get a lot of students that are like, should I just turn on that thing where it just, when I post here, it also posts over here. What is your opinion about that? Cause that's kind of that, that billboard strategy. Um, well, it's not, if your content is, is value-based in the first place, mm. billboard strategy really means like, you know, literally posting something that's like, I have a song coming out, make sure you pre-save it. Like, and there's nothing else, right. Or things that are like, um, you know, practicing today, like, you know, hashtag scales or whatever, like whatever it is, but that it's not actually great content in the first place. That's what I mean by like billboard or bulletin board posting. It's like when you really don't actively participate, but you're more just like sharing, like you're like, it's like you walk in a room and you go, Hey, this thing. And then you leave. Right. right. But like, people are like, well, what are you talking about? Right. Um, so I don't think if you create a fantastic post for Instagram and then reshare it to Facebook, that's okay. I do that. I don't, I don't, I'm not like super active on Facebook on my page, but I share my content over from Instagram. Um, and you know, I think that's fine because the content itself is good. Right. So it's not like I'm just being like, Hey, I have a course coming out, make sure you buy it and then <laughs> leaving. Right. Yeah. That's not, that's not great content. People aren't really going to resonate with that. So really the thing, the takeaway here is like make good content. That's, that's something that people can connect with and feel like they, that you get them, they get you like, you guys have a, like a two-way relationship. There's give and take. And, um, when you do ask for stuff, then it doesn't seem so out of the blue or spammy. It feels like natural to that 
to yeah, that point. Right? Absolutely. I mean, it's just like if you were to only write to your email list when you had something to sell. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's like the same exact thing. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Perfect. So I think then the next level of this, when people are like, okay, I get it. This, you know, I need to post value and all that stuff. How can they create a system where they've got consistency, where they know what they're doing and they're not getting up every day being like, oh my gosh, what am I going to post? You know, that is just like the worst when you wake up in the morning and you're like, now I have to have time to think, to figure out what I'm going to do. How can they create a system where this feels easy for them? So by planning content and creating it ahead of time. So, um, I talk about this all the time. I actually have a product called the content alignment toolkit that helps you to plan a month in advance. And when I say that to people, they'll be like, well, what the heck? Like I can't plan content. It's going to be like canned, you Mm -hmm. know, it's going to, you know, but that's not at all the case. So here's the thing when you, what I call panic post, right? So it's like that feeling of I'm waking up and I, oh my God, I have to post something today, right? Um, you are creating inferior content by doing that because it's not going through a thought process. You're not thinking about what your audience needs from you. You're not thinking about, um, you know, what you can provide for them that day or what their pain point is or what they're struggling with. And, and you're not telling, you're just panicking and posting something. And that type of content, even if you're really good at like spontaneously coming up with a super awesome post, it's stressful. (laughs) Like it's just stressful to think of it that way. Right. So when you, when you post that kind of content in the moment, you're not thinking of a big picture and it's so important to think about a big picture. You have to kind of think of when you're creating content, what's the point a that my audience is at now. And what's the point B that I want them to get at. And how can I get them through that journey? But let me dig into that because I feel like that's taught a ton for entrepreneurs, but for musicians, their people aren't necessarily in a pain point. Like maybe they don't know that they want, they need your music today to make them, you know, have a better day. How do we, how do we utilize that idea as musicians when we're just trying to like entertain people or maybe get a message out there to people with our music and our content? So, yeah. So it's not just about the music, like the music is part of it. Right. But it's not just about that. It's about like the second thing you said, which is like, get a message out there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. So, you know, like I was saying with my students, like take the next step up, what's the next level. You're not just a musician. You are here to tell people what you are here to help them feel what you are here to help them open their eyes about what you know, whatever it is, everybody, every musician has some sort of, um, thing they care about. That is why they write music or part of why they write music. Maybe there's more than one thing. Right. Um, so sharing that stuff is, is a big deal because I think that it really gets people to connect with you, even if they aren't a musician or understand, you know, the jargon of being a musician, they're still connecting with you as a person. So that's really important. The other thing is, um, you know, value for your audience, if they are already fans of your music might just be giving them more perspective on your music that you're not sharing with them. So, um, you know, how do I write songs? How often am I practicing? Who do I work with and why? Like, how do I choose what goes on an album? All those things, <clears throat> fans care. They want to know that stuff. So if you already have like a devoted fan base, I'm sure they're hoping for more information from you about their favorite songs. Right. So I would say both of those things, um, you know, it's not just about listening to the song. It's a, it's about connecting with you as their favorite musician or as a human being, both of those things. Perfect. Thank you for that. Cause I'm, yeah. I'm always looking for everybody's perspective on that one, because I think that's one that musicians struggle with a lot. And regarding the consistent content and the planning a month in advance, I just have to throw this in there because like I said, we've just started doing an Instagram strategy and I would recommend to everyone, get somebody on your team, even if it's a volunteer, even if it's a fan that wants to help you out, that does kind of a content creation session with you once a month. What we've started doing is, you know, we plan half a day once a month where we're going to record the video content that we want 
and we're going to, you know, write the, the posts that we want, you know, like I'm doing like a tip Tuesday and I'm going to do a Q and a post, or I'm going to, you know, do a video, a couple of video stories every month you know, we get that bang that all out in one day. I just did that this Monday. And I was like, I feel like, oh my gosh, I just accomplished like a month's worth of stuff in one morning. It yeah. feels so good. That doesn't mean you can't post things on the fly, right? Those are in addition, but you've mm-hmm. got this stuff in the bank that you can just deploy and you know, it's there for you and you don't have to stress about it for the entire month. But Don't leave it up to yourself alone, because I know for me, I would just keep procrastinating that if it wasn't on my calendar where I had to meet somebody at this particular time, (laughs) I had to get, you know, get all prettied up and be on video and all that stuff because I had put it on my calendar and someone's expecting me to be there. Yeah. I love the idea of having a fan, um, help moderate stuff too. Um, you know, that made me think of like, if you have a Facebook group as a band, you know, having fans that are moderators of the group mm-hmm. that can help create content would be really cool. Like, so yeah, having them involved. Cause that, you know, you really want thinking about community and about connection. How special are those people going to feel that they get to be like kind of curators of your content? Oh, so yeah. And they yeah. could create like so easily create like engagement questions for the community, because if they're fans, they have those same questions. Exactly. Right? You know, what's yeah. your favorite song? What, which, which song do you think that, that our favorite band should cover next? You know, things like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I love absolutely. that. I love that. Well, is there anything we haven't covered yet that you think needs to be covered around these subjects of marketing and branding and content? I just think like kind of reiterating that, you know, you can be in alignment with what you share on social media personally. Like you don't have to feel like it's a chore or a job or, um, that you have to like put on a specific hat to go do it. Right. (laughs) Um, everything that we do as far as like administration or content creation or, um, email marketing, all that stuff allows us to be creatives and share our work with others. So it's like, it's not like, there's no world that exists except for if you're like Rihanna (laughs) where, and not even if you're Rihanna, because she has to go do interviews and things like that. Right where you only get to create the music. You have to like sort of be open to the idea that the other stuff allows you to create the music, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's just like this whole holistic view of like being a musician, being a creative means that you, um, you are an entrepreneur and that you have to kind of like have this holistic mindset that like the music itself is not a hundred percent of what you do. So Um, I I remember uh, my husband was telling me about uh, Phoebe Bridgers was talking about this the other day where she was on SNL and somebody was like, how cool is it that you get to like be on SNL and perform your music and like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And she was like, yeah, it's, it's cool. But like, I also have to do other stuff like interviews like this and, you know, like (laughs) rehearse and uh, play the same song 280 times, you know, like whatever. She's like, there's more than just playing on SNL, you know, and it's just, it's important to remember that. So just kind of reminding people that it's all part of being able to be a creative and a musician, and it can all feel really good. If you, if you are like aligned with what you do. Yeah. I love that holistic approach. Like we both said in our own stories, like we needed to put all these pieces together into one person. And so, you know, don't think about, Oh, now I'm going to put my marketing hat on. Like you're always wearing your marketing hat. And it doesn't even need to be like, quote, marketing. It could just be like telling stories or, you know, telling, you know, talking about more deeper things about my personal life or the message that I want to convey. It doesn't have to be marketing because that marketing word like trips people up a lot, I think. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Agreed. Okay. Well, let, let everybody know how they can find you online. I know you've got a podcast as well. So if they're listening to this, they're probably going to want to check out your podcast. Yeah. My podcast is called creative brand sessions. So you can find me there. Um, if you go to Megan dash Kuhar.com slash roadmap, there is a free download. You can grab, um, the roadmap to brand alignment. So it teaches you how to uncover your brand, communicate it through impactful content and feel good about your business. So people can go ahead and grab that for free. And they're welcome to join me on Instagram as well. It's Megan Kuhar on Instagram. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you, Bree. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 